scrapbook. Split the county. Hello there. We told you last night about the fight to move the county seat down from Montesano to Hopewood and how it ended up a failure for the harbor end of the county when the East Enders split the West and voted. We told you of the fierce pitch of the battle and the aftermath. How when the East Enders had won, the county seat was to remain in Montesano on the grounds that the county couldn't afford a new courthouse and didn't need one anyhow. The East Enders changed their tune and demanded a new courthouse for Montesano. We told you that at that point, civil war, as real as it could be without shooting, swept over the little county. Shehala's County, as they called it then. Tonight we're going to complete that story and tell you how the citizens of the Lower Harbor, Hoquiam and Aberdeen specifically, fought another battle to split the county in two. A very real battle for the, for the most of those involved, and one that had repercussions all over the Northwest. But as is our custom before we begin, begin tonight's story, here's Dick Crombie and a few words from our sponsors. Now the battle had been hot enough when the east end of the county was fighting the west end over whether they should move the courthouse. But when it was decided that the courthouse should remain in Montesano, and the Montesano delegation began immediately to plunk for a new courthouse, the strain was too great. Something had to happen, and that something was the movement to split the county into two. It began in the fall of 1906, right after the commissioner had started action to provide the county with an architectural plan for a courthouse at a cost of $100,000. The Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce, under its president, Edward C. Finch, was the prime mover in this venture. It began with a political maneuver. Alex Polson was the state senator from the Harbor District and he was among those who strongly resented the high-handed methods by which the west end of the county had been swindled, as West Enders would have it, out of their rightful due, the county seat. So even before he went to Olympia for legislative term in January, he had read over the bill designed to split off the west part of Chehalis County and call it Grays Harbor. It would leave Montesano as the county seat for Chehalis County, but create a new county of Grays Harbor with the seat of government in Hopewim. And when the legislature met in January, bang, the bill went into the machinery of government. Now, the Grays Harbor delegation backing the bill was determined not to leave a stone unturned in their efforts to put across their split and give the entire personnel of the state government a chance to see their predicament. They planned to bring them to Grace Harbor, not the governor and the House of Legislation alone, but also all the state of officers and the ladies of all the Olympia delegations. It was a colossal scheme to publicize Grace Harbor, especially Aberdeen and Hoquiam, and to present the problem so that all could see why Grays Harbor should be a separate entity from Chehalis County and entitled to its own county seat. And on February 11, 1907, the big excursion train rolled west from Olympia with Governor Meade, the House of Legislatures, their wives and families, and most of the state officers. It was a special train, and as it rolled into the Aberdeen Station, the town band was out to play There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. President Ed Finch of the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce boarded the train at Junction City and spoke in each coach, inviting them all to a big banquet at the Washington Hotel. The sightseeing tour, the trips through the industrial plants, and the excursion to Moe Cliff. Everything is free, he told them. Keep your money in your pockets. Don't spend a cent. When the train stopped in Aberdeen, the state delegation moved up 
moved a mess to the Washington Hotel, overflowing the Fairmont and the Savoy. In the streets in front of the depot, hack drivers shouted, free ride, and drove bulging leads to the hotel. At the hotel bars, a sign was out, free beer to all the visitors, and at 3 p.m., the big free banquet began. It was for men only. The ladies were being entertained at the Crescent Hotel over on Market Street, where Mrs. W.J. Patterson and Mrs. Alex Polson presided. And at the Washington, the husbands, W.J. Patterson and Senator Alex Polson, were the host, along with Chamber President Finch. The late latter was Toastmaster for the speaking, and after the preliminary remarks by Mayor Eugene France of Aberdeen and A.J. McIntyre of Hoquiam, they went through the list of important guests. Governor Albert Mead sounded a key note when he applauded the initiative and public spirit of the people of the harbor. It was a good fellowship clan bake of a high order with frequent mention of Polson's bill that would come up before the Senate within a week. And it was community lobbying with finesse. By the time the curtain had fallen on the festive occasion, Grace Harbor boast boosters and the state delegation members were old friends, seeing eye to eye on one thing in particular, the Polson bill. But that wasn't all. The Grace Harbor boosters weren't ready to let the state house returned to Olympia. After a short night's rest, they loaded them all aboard a special train and took them to Hope Wing, where they toured the industrial plants and viewed the city's before mo clips and a clam bake. At noon, the beach resort town welcomed them with high festivities and perfect weather by the early afternoon. They had returned to Aberdeen, where they were ready to leave for the state capitol. Oh, there had been a delay. A donkey engine was being moved across the tracks between Aberdeen and Hoquiam, and it held the train up for an hour. And when the train was ready to leave Aberdeen, the railroad bridge had failed to close properly after swinging to, permi to permit a boat to pass and held the train up for another hour and a half. In the meantime, another meal hour arrived, but unscheduled. So President Edward C. Finch boarded the waiting train and again invited the entire party to return to the Washington for another big dinner on the Chamber of Commerce. When some of the voyagers went instead to the restaurant because the crowd of the hotel, the Chamber of Commerce sent runners to all the restaurants to invite them to accept no money from the visitors. Send the bill to the Chamber of Commerce, they told them and the rush was on to eat steaks on the Aberdeen organization. It was finally 7.30 when the Olympia delegation started for home and the Chamber of Commerce toted a $3,000 bill for their apple polishing weekend. But as it proved, their expenditure provided the desired boost for the Polson bill. A week later, the Senate passed a measure by a vote of 32 to 5. The Chamber of Commerce figured that the five were the quintet who, for one reason or another, failed to make the trip down to the harbor. Since the House had previously passed the bill 70 to 12, it was ready for the governor's signature. There were a few suggestions for arbitration made before the governor put pen to the bill. Representative Croft of Pierce County suggested that since Montesano appeared to be in the minority, which had stirred up the ruckus, it should take steps to mend the situation before it was too late. He suggested that the city waive its right to the county courthouse and permit it to be moved down to Hoquiam, but nothing came of that. Just before the governor put pen to the bill, a delegation of harbor men made a trip to Olympia to argue the case before the governor. Those who talked against the split were W.H. Bush of Montesano, J. R. O'Donnell and E. L. Minard of Elma, Stanley Smith of Cosmopolis, and two men from Hoquiam who felt the harbor cities had taken the wrong course. There were George Emerson and his son-in-law, Frank Lamb. On the other side of the fence was the favorable delegation O. C. Fennelson from Hoquiam and E. B. Ben, 
M.R. Sherwood, E.C. Finch, and E.E. E. Boner of Aberdeen. When the governor had heard all they had to say, he signed the bill that would create two counties from Chehalis County, and Hope William and Aberdeen cheered at the news. But it was only at the end of a round, as history has established, it was not the end of the fight. The state, which had never faced quite such a situation, had to find out a lot more about what it could legally do in such a crisis, and the bill with the governor's signature, went to the Attorney General for an opinion. Back it came with information that to be in accordance with the Constitution, it must be accompanied by a petition signed by at least three-fourths of the voters of the county requesting the separation. That gave the Grace Harbor backers something to work on in the spring of 1907 as they went back to work. Meanwhile, the county commissioner pulled a maneuver out of his hat that left Aberdeen and Hopium click speechless. Over the almost violent opposition of Com Commissioner Sherwood, the other two appropriations of funds of 5000 to fight the split for the county, the money was to go to a fund to retain W. H. Abel of Montesano and J. M. Ashton of Tacoma to fight the measure through the Supreme Court of the United States if needed. It came like a bolt of lightning on the Grace Harbor boosters who were already beginning to call everything west of Montesano, Grace Harbor County. They held a council of war. Out of their meeting came the decision to file an immediate suit to join the commissioners for paying the sum and Sam Ben. The patriarch founder of Aberdeen stepped into the picture with his attorney, W.I. Agnew. In Judge Irwin's coat, they were granted the injunction, a temporary injunction only, restraining the commissioners from making the payment. By this time, there were whole factions at the opposite ends of the county who were not speaking to each other but spoke to each other with such hostility and rancor that several personal duels were prevented only by interventions of friends. It was on the 20th of May that Grace Harbor Boosters decided they had enough signatures on the petition and with more than 3,000 voters' names appended to the request for a change in the county's name, it was forwarded to the governor. But again, the step was only another in a tangle of litigation that had been stirred up in the Civil War. The governor named a superior court judge from a neighboring county and required by constitutional provision to review the petition and decide on its legality. Judge Rice of Lewis County was named and it was announced that when the judge had been satisfied that the petition contained the required majority and was in good order, he would declare the creation of a new county, the County of Grace Harbor. Meanwhile, Judge Irwin's decision on the injunction had been challenged. Judge Griffin of Seattle had been named to hear the proceedings between the two fa factions as they took their cases to court. It was Ashton and Abel for the East County fraction and Hogan and Agnew for Sam Ben. And then, as the affair had from the day it started, the battle took a new twist, and Grace Harbor Boosters found themselves facing a new front. Judge Rice from Lewis County, who had been given the final word, threw his hands up and referred the whole thing to the state Supreme Court, and the petition, the law, and the whole hassle was placed in the hands of seven good men and true who were the state's prime arbitrators. And so, in an era of conflict, the summer of 1907 dragged through the autumn. San Ben was suing the county commissioners. The commissioners were trying to build a courthouse. The state Supreme Court was sitting on a decision as to the legality of the state law. And whether the county was split legally or not, it was split literally between the two red-hot factions. We're going to make room for Dick to give us a word from our sponsor, and then we'll come back to tell you the rest of the story. That autumn of 1907 was an embattled season for Chehalis County. It looked as though spring would see the county split in two and the western half 
anticipated the event with glee to think of the revenge. Articles showed that Grace Harbor would have a population of more than 25,000, while Chehalis County would barely have 15,000. And then, in the state Supreme Court in November, Judge Root wrote the majority decision, concurring in by Judges Hadley, Dunbar, Crow, and Rudkin. The act was unconstitutional. Judges Mount and Fullerton dissented, but that was the end of the attempt to split the county. But not the attempt to have something done about the county seat. Attorneys and professional men with business in the county seat still worked to bring some of the county offices to the lower harbor. They wanted sessions in the Superior Court held in Aberdeen. They petitioned the state again to take action, and a bill was passed which would have provided for the court sessions in the lower harbor cities. But this time, Governor Lister vetoed it. That was in 1915. But that same year, the state legislator, le legislature passed a law that, in effect, accomplished one of the things that the harbor boosters had fought for. In February 1915, the Senate passed the measure. In March, the House enacted the bill. On March 15th, the governor signed it. And on the 9th of June 1915, Chehalis became Grays Harbor County. The long fight appeared to be over. There was a road now between Montesano and the harbor cities and a reasonable degree of peace had returned to the embattled residents. And the nearly 35 years that have moved over that date have, obliter have obliterated the scars of war. And the real civil war between East and West was finally at an end in this chapter of our hometown scrapbook. Thank you for listening. Thank you.